Hey everybody, Professor Davis here from chemsurvival.com and the YouTube channel Chem Survival. So today I'd like to look back at a topic we covered a few weeks ago, uh, and that is nuclear weapons. Um, last time we talked about tritium doping and how that influences their stability and their yield. But today I want to answer a different question that came in from a subscriber. And it's an insightful question. It asks the following. So if uranium and plutonium make such good nuclear weapons, right? We can make fission devices from these. And we know that elements that are closely grouped on the periodic table tend to have similar properties to one another. Then why is it then that no one ever talks about the use of neptunium in nuclear weapons? It's nestled there neatly between uranium and plutonium, the two most commonly discussed uh, sources for fission weapons. In fact, uh, uranium and plutonium, of course, we know were used to make uh, Little Boy and Fat Man, respectively, two of the most infamous nuclear weapons ever designed. And yet we never hear about Neptunium. The question here is, could Neptunium, at least theoretically, be used in the same type of application? Now, to start answering this question, uh, I jumped over to the NUDAT website at Brookhaven National Labs and took a look at one of the more common isotopes of Neptunium, that is Neptunium-237. And based on its properties, it certainly does look like it could potentially be used as fuel for a nuclear bomb. It has a half-life of about 2 million years, and it is indeed a fissile isotope, meaning it does tend to undergo that cracking of the nucleus into two smaller nuclei that's necessary uh, for a, a payload to work an efficient device. We put that 2 million year half-life to the test. Of course, we find that even after about 100 years, longer than any nuclear weapon has, has existed today, that uh, still 99.99% of the Neptunium-237 would still be there in the payload if we could create one using this particular isotope of this particular element. So let's review really quickly how gun type and implosion devices work and see if we can decide whether or not Neptunium would be a, a proper choice for these kind of designs. Now remember, in a gun type bomb, a conventional explosive is used to shoot two subcritical masses together. And once they have merged and they form a critical mass, the neutron flux at the center of that critical mass of material is sufficient to start off that runaway reaction, and we ultimately get a nuclear explosion. So in order for this to happen, the element or the isotope that's being used has to have a, a low enough neutron activity that it doesn't inadvertently fizzle out, meaning that it doesn't actually start a non-runaway uh, reaction before we actually assemble the critical mass that can cause it to kind of conk out before it ever starts. And uranium just happens to be perfectly suited for this. Its 235 isotope is an excellent choice. Now, the other type of device we discussed was an implosion type device in which we have a sphere of our nuclear material that's surrounded by a conventional explosive and some type of a reflector that will bounce neutrons back into the inside of the device. And when those explosives are detonated, the core compresses the neutron flux increases, the reflector amplifies that, and we get enough neutron flux for an explosion. So naturally, what's important here is you have to have a nuclear payload, nuclear material, that can be compressed. We need to be able to squeeze it down into a higher density state so that we reach that criticality. And as it turns out, uranium-235 is very difficult to compress in this way, whereas plutonium actually has a pretty decent compressibility. And so this is why plutonium is generally used in these implosion devices, while uranium-235 seems to be used more commonly in gun-type devices. So what about neptunium? Let's get down to it here. Well, if we look at some of the properties of these, it starts to look pretty promising, actually. Uh, neptunium was discovered around the same time as plutonium, so scientists were aware of it, even as they were developing the very first nuclear weapons. Uh, as we mentioned before, the half-life is about 2 million years. That's plenty long for this material to sit on the shelf without having to worry too much about radioactive decay rendering our payload uh, non-critical anymore. The so-called bare critical mass, that's simply the mass of a sphere of this material that you would need in order to achieve criticality. Uh, remember that a lot of times we're compressing these things, but a bare critical mass is a good way of getting an approximate idea of how useful a material might be in this application. And neptunium-237 is not far behind uranium and plutonium. You could certainly create a nuclear weapon using uh, you know, a few dozen kilograms of neptunium. But what I thought was most interesting as I was researching this video is I learned that neptunium-237 
actually has both a low neutron background, making it suitable for a gun type bomb, but also is quite compressible, making it suitable for an implosion device. So while uranium is confined generally to making gun type bombs and plutonium generally to making these implosion type devices, it would appear that Neptunium-237 could be used in either type of design, and that seems fairly attractive. So if that's the case, then why is it that Neptunium has never been used in a nuclear weapon, or at least that no nuclear nation has ever admitted to using it in a nuclear weapon? Okay, so let's think about how Neptunium-237 might be made. Now, we talked about what goes on inside of a nuclear weapon, that fission event that releases so much energy when a neutron strikes a fissile isotope like 235 in this example, causing it to crack into two relatively large fractions of itself and releasing additional neutrons to create high neutron flux, which gives you that runaway chain reaction. But not every time that a neutron strikes one of these nuclei does this fission event happen. In some cases, neutrons are absorbed into the nucleus instead. Now imagine a U-235 nucleus in a very high neutron flux environment, so it's being constantly hit by neutrons, and instead of undergoing fission, it absorbs a couple of neutrons. Now in this case, what would happen? Well, we would go from the uranium-235 isotope to the uranium-237 isotope. And a quick check at NUDAT tells us that the half-life of this material is only about six days, and that it decays principally by a beta decay, meaning that an electron is lost from the nucleus, thereby converting a neutron into a proton. What that means is that we've gone off the nuclear stability curve by adding neutrons. The uranium is going to react by ejecting an electron from its nucleus to get back towards the stable part of the curve. And that means we're going to make neptunium-237 in this beta decay. So while the intermediate has a half-life of six days, the product neptunium-237 has a half-life of millions of years, it will accumulate in the nuclear reactor when the neutron flux is just right. So if we know that neptunium forms in reactors, and we know that it's potentially useful in fission devices, um, why haven't we used it? Or why wasn't it used initially even? And there are some clues to this if we look at the ISIS report from the late 1990s written by David Albright and Kevin O'Neill. Now, in this report, they, they make two interesting points. One of those is that by the end of the millennium, it's expected that the world was going to have about 80 tons of neptunium and americium collected from spent nuclear fuel. That is enough to build literally thousands of nuclear devices based on a neptunium payload. However, that's still a very, very small quantity in comparison to plutonium. In fact, in common reactors, the amount of neptunium that's formed is only about 5% that of plutonium, which is formed by similar processes, that neutron capture and then beta decay. And so while neptunium may be a promising uh, nucleus to use, there's just so much more plutonium that it's easier to engineer a weapon that uses the plutonium. Right? And, and, and uh, basically, if you've got that, then why would you bother with the neptunium? So it appears as though it was simply a question of scale and economics. It's easier to get your hands on plutonium-239 than it is to get your hands on a significant amount of neptunium-237. However, if there's an interest in building a nuclear weapon from neptunium, there certainly appears to be enough of the fissile isotope available, and it certainly seems to have all the properties necessary to engineer a functional fission device. So that's the answer to your question, folks. Yes, you certainly could use neptunium in the same way that uranium and plutonium are used to create a tactical nuclear weapon. And although no nation has ever done so, or at least admitted to doing so yet, there's no reason to believe that at some point in the future, it might not actually be employed. That's all for today, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'm Professor Davis, chemsurvival.com, YouTube channel, Chemsurvival. See you next time.